Y'all, please be seated, please. Uh, August 29th, 1993, you can't even imagine. I've told some of you, but you can't even imagine the pit that he pulled me out of and gave me something important in life, gave me a calling in life. You know what? That could happen to somebody here today. I wasn't expecting it at Calvary Baptist Church in George, Georgetown, Illinois. I wasn't expecting it to be pulled out of the grave that day. I was a basketball coach in the community, and I thought it would be good for my image to go to church. But God grabbed me that day, and my life has forever been changed. He pulled me out of the pit, and he is still in the pit-pulling business today if you want him want him to. I appreciate y'all being here today. My name is Mark, and I'm one of the pastors uh, here, and just appreciate you. If you're visiting with us today, I hope that you've got, gotten a, a gift. Um, there's some, I've written five different uh, devotional books, and there's some over here. There's some out at the welcome table out there. There's also coffee mugs that they have for you, and we just want to thank you for being here today and certainly hope that you will return. Before we start our service, I want to, uh, we have several important announcements, and I'll get to most of those at the end of the service, but 
I want to let you know that for those of you that have been attending our church for a while, uh, we have membership class tomorrow night. And uh, you may be attending for a few months, and, and uh, you kind of want to know what this Nazarene thing is, is all about. And uh, the membership class is for you. There's absolutely zero commitment. We've had a lot of people that have come and attended our membership class and never joined. There's no commitment for coming. You just come there, and you learn a little bit about who we are and what we believe. And I know you're tired of me saying it, but you learn the difference between a Nazarene and Tangerine, okay? And so that's tomorrow night at 6.30. It'll be over at 8 o'clock. And if you would like to be a member of our church or maybe just want some information about us, uh, that class would be for you. So I'd ask that you would consider that. Please be in prayer this week as we make our third mission trip uh, in this hurricane season for the last seven weeks, I think. We go back down for a third time this week and try to help um, uh, a 98-year-old man and an 81-year-old woman be able to reconstruct their house that was just gutted by those uh, two hurricanes, Hurricane Milton and Hurricane something. I can't remember the name of the other. Helene, Helene okay. But seven guys are going down there. Two of them are driving. They've already left. They attended the first service this morning, and they've already left, and they're driving the trailer down with all of our tools and all that kind of stuff. And five guys will jump on an airplane tomorrow and uh, meet them down there. And um, please be in prayer for them as they continue to witness to the goodness of God by reaching out to people who uh, really need help in uh, this situation. So let's, uh, let's pray as we begin our service this morning. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, we thank you that we walked in freely today, and we don't have any worry about people knocking down the doors and wonder why we're in here to worship. Many of our Christian friends around the world have that worry, and we pray for them today that your presence will be with them to protect them as many of them are worshiping behind locked doors. We pray for our neighboring churches around here and there's many people in Xenia right now that are meeting uh, in the name of your son Jesus Christ and we pray for the same spirit that we need right here um, they need at their church as well. So I pray you bless our, our community churches this morning. Pray you'd help Pastor Jared as he brings the word and I pray you'd help him to communicate uh, in an effective way what you have laid upon his heart. I pray for Josh and everybody behind me as they lead us in song. May we worship you uh, today with um, all of our hearts. I pray for um, uh, J uh, Brian up in the, in the children's church and all that he's doing up there right now with ministering to kids. I thank you for all of the lay people that are up there ministering and uh, uh, Father, you know we couldn't have put this church service on today if it wasn't more than 50 lay people are helping us in some way, shape, or form today, and we appreciate them and thank you for them. Father, help us be worshipers today that you seek, and your word tells, it, you, tells us that you seek worshipers who will worship you in spirit and in truth. May that be said of us today. We pray these things in our own name given that we may, must be saved, and that's the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, before we stand and, and start our song service this morning, would you turn and would you greet a few people around you, and would you welcome them to Xenia Nazarene? your way back to your seats. Please remain standing as we worship. Oh, 
it out, died for us, and rose again. Can we just give him praise this morning? Hell's overcome in his name.
Good morning, church. Isn't it good to be in God's house this morning? It's so good to be with y'all. It's great to be gathered together as the body of Christ. I pray that that is something that we never take for granted, getting to gather together as the body of Christ. It's so good to be with y'all this morning. I'm glad that you are here. Uh, There's a few of us from our church and a few of us from across the Southwest Ohio district. Um, If you don't know, the Church of the Nazarene has districts, and being in Xenia, we belong to the Southwest Ohio District, and we hosted at our church yesterday uh, some children's Bible quizzing from across the district. Yeah, it was great. We had one person get first place, another person get seventh place, and um, we got to host a lot of different churches and their families and the kiddos here, and um, if there is anything that I could think of that would be a great opportunity for me as a parent with my children and for you uh, who might be parents that have children is to do something like maybe get them involved in Bible quizzing. What better thing can we do for them than give them opportunities with not just themselves but other uh, kids as well to grow in the knowledge of the Word of God. And so if that is something that you might be interested in uh, for your kid, Please uh, come see one of us pastors or see Miss Carol Neal in the back. Um, she's kind of the one that heads it up for our church specifically. But uh, it, it was an awesome opportunity to get to do that yesterday. And uh, if you've never been to a Bible quiz, competitive, good time. Um, I have never been. I have like seen throughout you know my childhood and, and teen years and stuff like that just a little bit of it, but I'd never really truly been at an entire uh, quiz before. And then yesterday I got asked to be the quiz master, which uh, is not as great of a title as it sounds because all I had to do was just read a script. It wasn't you know not too much pressure or anything like that. But uh, it was an awesome time, and just encourage you if that's something that you might be interested in for for one of your kids, uh, be a great way for them to grow in the knowledge of God's word. 
Uh, speaking of which, we're going to get into God's Word this morning, which is an awesome thing that we do here at Xenia Naz. And for the past few weeks, we have been going through a series called What Did Jesus Say? Really taking a look into the Gospels and diving deep into the red letters of the Gospels of the words and teachings of Jesus. And what does Jesus have to say back then that is still very, very true for us today and very applicable to our lives. And so we've kind of been going through uh, the past few weeks of that. And this morning, if you've got your Bibles handy, we're going to be in the Gospel of Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, and we're going to be starting with verse 31. Mark chapter 8, starting with verse 31, I do believe we're going to have it for y'all on the screen, but we are going to be going through a decent-sized chunk of Scripture, and so if you do have your Bibles on you, I really recommend that you keep them kind of handy. We're going to be going through just kind of in order, verse by verse, and we're going to be starting in verse 31, and so I'm also going to ask before we start reading this passage If you are able, would you please stand to honor the reading of God's word this morning? Mark chapter 8, starting with verse 31, reading from the NIV. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. So that right there was Jesus talking to his disciples. And we see in the next verse, now he turns and he starts addressing the crowd in verse 34. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said... Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation... The Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, we love you. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we have access to it, that we can get into your word any chance, that we, any time that we want to, Lord. And God, I pray that this morning as we get into your word that your will, your truth would be proclaimed, that you would speak to every single heart here. And God... As we dive into your word, would you please give us eyes to see and ears to hear? It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. So, the Gospels, each one is a little bit different. If you don't know what the Gospels are, the word Gospel literally means good news. And we have four Gospels, four written accounts of the life and ministry of Jesus from different people's uh, perspectives. And this morning we're looking at Mark. And Mark is a little bit distinct and a little bit different than the rest of the Gospels. Matthew gives us a good history. He gives us Starting out the genealogy of Jesus. We kind of see the lineage that Jesus comes from and kind of his uh, family background and ultimately where he comes from. Uh, Luke is a physician. Luke is a doctor. And Luke gives us a very detailed doctor's kind of perspective even of the life of Jesus starting out with the birth story of Jesus. Many of you are probably going to read from Luke's gospel coming into the Christmas season with your family, probably from Luke's perspective, uh, because Luke gives us a very detailed account of the birth of Jesus. And then you skip ahead to John, and John gives us this deep theology and deep theological perspective of Jesus and the life of Jesus and kind of even the Trinity and he starts it out with in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God but Mark on the other hand Mark just gets like right after he just jumps right into the heart of Jesus's ministry and life and that's no exception with where we're at this morning in Mark chapter 8 we're right in the heart of Jesus's ministry. We see that he just got done 
feeding 5,000 people. And funny enough, the miracle that always gets overlooked whenever Jesus fed 4,000 people. Um, it's not as big a number as 5,000, so people always know about the 5,000. But he also did another miracle where he fed 4,000 people. And from a lot of biblical uh, historians and experts, they believe that that was just an account of the men. That didn't even include the women and children. So it's quite likely that those numbers were even bigger than that. Uh, but we also see where we're at. We see Jesus is performing these miracles. Jesus is teaching to large crowds. He's also teaching his 12 chosen disciples. Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees and their lack of faith. He's answering their questions and all different kinds of things. But right before where we're at this morning, Jesus literally just got done establishing with the disciples who he is. He asks them, Peter specifically, or Simon, who do you say that I am? And Simon says, well, you're the Messiah. You're the son of God. You're the one that we've been waiting for. It's true. You really are who you say you are. And Jesus turns and looks to Simon and says, good. Your name will no longer be Simon, but it will be Peter. Because with that kind of a faith, that is the rock upon which I will build my church. And so he just gets done establishing with his disciples that he's the Messiah. And then that's where we find ourselves shortly after that, in verse 31, in complete contrast to that, it says, He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. And so we literally go from the best news that the disciples could be hearing that the Messiah, the one they've been waiting for, really is here, and he's with them, and he's chosen them to be his disciples. The best news ever, he gets done establishing with that with them, and just a little bit later, man, what a roller coaster. The highs, and then the lows. The best news that they could ever hear, and then they find out that he's going to be rejected, and not just rejected by anybody, he's going to be rejected by the religious leaders, and it's not going to stop there. He's going to be killed, and he tells them the outcome. He tells them what's going to happen in the end, but they kind of forget that part or just gloss over that. So he tells them he's going to rise again after being killed in three, three days, but literally a roller coaster for them of going from the best news that they could hear to now the worst news that they could hear. And we see specifically in a little bit, even Peter, he's almost like in denial. Not if I have anything to say about it, Lord, they're not going to kill you. He's almost in denial of what Jesus is saying, but we're going to get to that in just a minute. What I want to kind of pause on this morning is who's he rejected by? It says he's rejected by the religious leaders. And now I want to kind of just got to pause there for a second because that kind of blows my mind a little bit. Of all people, when God wraps himself in flesh and comes down to this earth to be with us, of all people that should recognize God when he's here, it should be these religious leaders because they're the ones who know the word, who have studied scripture better than anybody, who have dedicated their lives to being the people of God and leading the nation, chosen nation and people of God, Israel's people. If there's anybody that should know who Jesus is, that he really is the Messiah and the Son of God, the Son of Man, everything that Jesus said, it's true. If there's anybody that should know that, it should be the religious leaders, that would be like today, me as a pastor, the pastors that we have here, other pastors, the professors, the people that study the word so much that should know the word and know that God's word better than anybody else probably. That would be like us, God coming down and us rejecting him. This, this doesn't make sense. Why of all people would they be the ones to reject him and have him killed. Well, what, what do we see taking place? Well, Jesus comes along, and Jesus is teaching. And his teaching is for everybody that hears his words, unlike anything they've ever heard before. And Jesus is going along, and these people, they have questions for him, and Jesus has answers. And he, he teaches and he speaks with this authority. 
And let's not forget the miracles that are taking place under Jesus' ministry as well. But then you got to think and contrast that these religious leaders, the Pharisees, they're the ones that go around and teach. They're the ones that normally are answering people's questions. But then they're the ones coming to Jesus with questions, and Jesus has answers, and they're not sure how they feel about Jesus' answers. And so Jesus comes along, and I can only imagine that this authority that the Pharisees are used to having, that these religious leaders are used to having, and the answers that they're used to having, and then this man almost seems like a rogue preacher comes along. I can only imagine that they probably feel a little bit threatened. And then Jesus comes along and starts saying that he's the son of man, that he's the son of God, that he's the Messiah, and they respond with blasphemy. That can't be true. And so because of that, they ultimately have him killed. Then it continues in verse 32. He spoke plainly about this. Jesus did. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples... He rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. I want to ask you a question this morning. Are you able to differentiate? Are you able to tell the difference between the voice of God and the voices of this world? Because I don't know if you know this or not, But there's a lot of voices out there. You can listen to a lot of voices. There's a lot of noise out there. And if we're going to be followers of Jesus, if we're going to be followers of God, it's probably pretty important that the sheep know the shepherd's voice. It's probably pretty important that if we're going to call ourselves followers of God, that we can follow him when he leads us. It's probably pretty important that we know the voice of God. And I believe that God can speak to you. I believe that you can hear the voice of God. I believe one way that God leads us sometimes is you just get this punch in the gut, this feeling in your gut that you're just like, that's probably not right. I probably shouldn't be going down that path. I probably shouldn't go that direction. I believe God can speak to you in all of those ways, but I believe the most obvious and greatest way that God speaks to us is in his word. And so it's so important that you don't just come here on Sunday mornings and the last time that you got into God's word was last Sunday morning. It's so important that if you're going to follow God, you know the voice of God and you know the will of God and you spend time in his word. So important if you're, because if you don't, if you don't know the voice of God, if you don't know what his leading is in your life, man, it's going to be so easy to get lost. It's going to be so easy to find yourself down the wrong path if you don't know God's will and his word. And so we see here, funny enough, as Peter rebukes Jesus, we see that Peter has really good intentions for Jesus. Peter didn't want Jesus to die. I think that's a pretty nice thing for Peter to do, or for Peter to want, for Jesus to not die. I think it'd be a pretty nice thing for me to not want any of y'all to die. I'm trying to protect you. I think that's probably a pretty nice thing to do. But the problem with Peter not wanting Jesus to die is that's going against the will of the Father of what he has planned for Jesus that goes against the very reason that God wrapped himself in flesh and came to this earth is because Jesus knew ultimately he was going to have to be the sacrifice for all of our sins. And so it's really important to remember that just because you have good intentions, just because Peter had good intentions, doesn't mean that it's the will of God. You can have the best of intentions for somebody. Somebody else can have the best of intentions for you. But is it the will of God? Is that God's will for your life? Peter meant well. 
The question is, can you recognize when something is not God's will and plan for your life and be able to have the mindset that Jesus shows us here and be able to immediately rebuke it? People can have the best of intentions for you. I had some people that loved me dearly that did not want me to be a pastor. They had good intentions for me, but it wasn't God's will for my life. People can have really good intentions, but it's not the will of God. The question is, can you recognize it? Can you know God's will and know God's word and rebuke it? If you don't, man, it's easy to get lost, y'all. It's really easy to find yourself down that road of temptation. Really easy. And man, we see here, poor Peter. Man, what a roller coaster for him. He just gets done around with the rest of the disciples watching. Your name will no longer be Simon. It'll be Peter because that kind of faith. You are the rock upon which I will build my church. And now he's being rebuked and being called Satan. Man, that's tough. What a tough day to be Peter. I don't think it's Jesus hating on Peter and specifically calling him Satan. I think it's Jesus recognizing the temptation that is in front of him and rebuking the temptation. Can we rebuke that temptation as well? Can we be quick to, because you gotta think about Jesus here in this moment. That's a temptation for him to not go to the cross. I don't think Jesus was eager to go be tortured and die on a cross. I don't think he was particularly excited about that. We see Jesus multiple times throughout his ministry. It was a temptation that was brought before him once whenever he was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, and then Satan comes to tempt him with an opportunity to have all the kingdoms of this earth without having to go through the cross. But ultimately, God had a greater plan for Jesus, not just the kingdoms of this earth, but the kingdoms of heaven and earth. But we see multiple times in Jesus' ministry where this is a temptation that he had to fight that he had to deal with as well. He's fully, Jesus is fully divine. He's fully God, but he's also fully human. He had to deal with the things that you and I deal with as well, being human. And one of those was obeying the will of the Father and going to the cross. And Peter had good intentions for Jesus. I don't want you to die, Lord. You're my Savior. You're my Messiah. you got to stay here with me. But Jesus had something so much greater in store for all the world, for the Jew and the Gentile, for all of us still to this day. And it ended up going through the cross. And so can we have the same mindset of Jesus to rebuke temptation when we see it? If you're ever going to be able to do that, first you need to know the will and word of God. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And what's funny is when we see Jesus here saying, take up your cross, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Uh, We today, 2,000 years later in the church, we recognize the cross as this beautiful sign and symbol of grace and forgiveness and sacrifice of what Jesus did and offers to all of us. It's beautiful. It's great. But 2,000 years ago, the cross didn't mean that for them. 2,000 years ago, the only thing that they knew the cross as is the way that Romans would punish not just any criminal, the worst of the worst criminals. That's how Rome would punish people. It was such a bad death. It was such a humiliating death. It was such a painful, torturous death that Rome would not even crucify Roman citizens. They would only do that to the people that they ruled over, in this case, Israel at that time. And so whenever Jesus says to the crowd, not just the disciples now, the 12, but to the crowd that is there, That if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. That would have spoken very loudly to them. Would have spoken loud and clear to all of them. 
He's warning them that if you're going to follow me, you first need to count the cost. You need to know what you're signing up for. And he's letting them know it's going to cost you everything. And so what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to deny yourself Deny your plan for your life. Deny your wants and desires and all the things that you want to chase after. Be able to deny those things. Take up your cross. Die to yourself. We talked about it last week. Be a living sacrifice. It's not about me anymore. And then come and follow him. And we see, especially with Peter here in this instance, like, Peter meant well for Jesus. And so often we might come up with an excuse for Jesus that oftentimes the excuse that we're presenting to him isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's not like we're denying the drugs and alcohol or something like that. But he also asks you to deny, well, let's look at some examples from Scripture. The rich young ruler, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life, to enter heaven, Lord? What must I do? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Follow the law. I do those things, Lord. Is there anything else? Give it all up. Sell it. Give it away. All those earthly possessions that you have, get rid of them. And then come follow me. He couldn't do it. Lord, I want to follow you, but I've got some things back at home I need to take care of. I've got to bury my father. Let the dead bury the dead. I need you now. Come follow me. I don't think there's anything wrong with caring for your home or loving your family. Those are all great things. Those are all good things that I think God would tell you to honor and to love. But if we hold them so tightly, if we've become so attached to the things of this earth that God has blessed us with, some of them being very good things, and we become so attached to them and we hold so tightly to those things that we elevate those things and hold tighter to those things than God, then we've got a problem. And so Jesus here, he's wanting them to know, hey, you first, if you're going to decide to follow me, You need to count the cost. I'm warning you here. I'm just giving you a heads up what it's going to look like, what it's going to cost you. If you're going to decide to follow me, don't be surprised when I ask of you. We can become too attached to these things. And I love when Jesus throws out the word cross there because we, especially today, The cross is one of the greatest examples that we have today of what it means to be a living sacrifice for others. Because Jesus, whenever he went to the cross, I don't know if you realize this or not, but it wasn't his sins that put him on that cross. He took the sins of others upon himself and died in our place. And so would we, as followers of Jesus, being a living sacrifice, would we be willing to carry the burdens of others. We talked about it last week, loving your enemies. Are you willing to love them even when they don't deserve it? The forgiveness and grace that God offers us, he extends to us even when we don't deserve it. He's asking us to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. This is a big calling, y'all. And he want, he's warning us, he's letting you know, if you're going to call yourselves a Christian, if you're going to choose to follow me, here's what it's going to look like, and I'm going to ask everything of you. One of the things that I struggle with so often sometimes as a pastor, and especially whenever I got to spend all that time on the road traveling as an evangelist and see the church all across America, and I don't think it's just from my time on the road, I think I've kind of seen this within the church in America uh, pretty much my whole 31 years that I've lived here on this earth, lived here in America, I've gotten to see it. So often we as pastors and we as church leaders ask so little of y'all. Ask so little of the body of Christ. 
And Jesus warns us and lets us know it's going to cost you everything. But we so often as pastors and leaders feel pressure for the church to be growing and for the church to be happy and for the church to not get too mad and not rock the boat too much. And we ask so little of y'all sometimes. And I want to warn y'all here, I'm new here. I'm not necessarily just saying this about us. I'm saying this about the church in America at large. I'm the new guy here. I'm still getting to know y'all. But so often pastors ask so little of their congregation because they don't want to make anybody mad, because they want to keep y'all happy, And all we're doing is setting y'all up to stay baby Christians all the time. Just keep nursing. You're never going to be able to eat any meat. You're never going to grow and be a mature Christian. Just stay in the back seat. Never do a thing. Never grow in God's word. Never mature. We ask so little of y'all because we want to keep you happy. And I think we as leaders within the church and us as pastors, we've set the bar so low. And Jesus sets the bar. It's your whole life. It's everything. It's all of you. And we as leaders and we as pastors, we should be asking more of y'all. So don't be surprised. Don't get so offended or hurt when we ask something of you. When we need your help. It's the body of Christ. We all got to participate in this. It's time to quit taking a back seat. It's time to quit doing nothing. It's time to, we got to quit doing nothing. (laughs) But hear me for real. It's time we start growing. It's time we quit getting so offended by things. It's not about you, y'all. It's not about me either. It's about him. That's why he's our identity. That's why we're baptized, not in our own name. That's why we're baptized in the name of Jesus. We've all got to work together. God's got a big plan for us. It's time we all start doing it. It's time we all step up. It's time we start growing and quit being these baby Christians, setting the bar so low because we just want to grow the numbers of our church and make everybody happy. That's not what it's about. He asks everything of you. And I know we're all in different walks, in different places in our faith, but I I want to warn you, if you're not a follower of Jesus, if you wouldn't say that you're a follower of Jesus or a Christian, I ain't preaching to you right now, but if you're calling yourself a follower of Jesus, if you say you're a Christian and you're a part of the body of Christ, it's everything. And hear me, I know we're all at different places places in our walk. Some of us are more mature. Some of us have been walking with Jesus a little bit longer. Some of us have been walking with Jesus for a pretty long time and we're still the baby. Some of us, Lord, you're asking for 10%? Don't cut yourself short at 10%. He wants more than that. He wants a hundred of you. He wants 100% of you. Don't think it's just 10%. That's too cheap. It's a lot more than that. Are we growing in the faith? Are we maturing? Are we giving ourselves to this? Are we holding on as tightly as we can to as much of us as we possibly can, getting offended and hurt over everything, And never stepping up to serve. Never stepping up to do anything. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. I know I just read that. And I kind of read it, if I'm being honest with y'all, a little bit quick. But maybe you've heard that verse before. Maybe you haven't. But listen to it again. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Now for some of us here, I can only imagine if this is maybe even your first time hearing it, imagine stepping into the shoes of the crowd that Jesus is speaking to right now. What Jesus just said might sound a little bit confusing. What Jesus just said 
Jesus, are you off your rocker a little bit? Are you, you sure you're okay? It might sound a little bit crazy. What's he getting at? Well, if you look at quite a bit of the teachings of Jesus, sometimes maybe your first glance at it, your first time hearing it, it might sound a little bit confusing. In John chapter 3, when Jesus is speaking with Nicodemus, he says that you're going to have to be born again. And Nicodemus, a pretty smart guy, one of the religious leaders that probably knows God's word pretty well, gets confused. And he's like, how can a grown man go back into his mother's womb? But that's not the only thing that Jesus says. He, he also says at times that the first will be last. He says that you're going to have to take the humble position of a servant and that to enter the kingdom of God, you must have childlike faith. He tells Nicodemus, you're going to have to be born again. He says, it's easier for a rich man to fit a camel through the eye, through the eye of a needle than to enter the kingdom of heaven. And now he says that if you want to save your life, you must lose it. But then Jesus continues on and says what is impossible with man is possible with God. What Jesus is teaching us here is that to truly find life, to truly find eternal life, you're going to have to die to yourself. You're going to have to be a living sacrifice. You're going to have to deny yourself if you truly want to find life. True, full, meaningful, eternal life. 